Good morning, everybody. Welcome to yet another edition of 18 Minutes with 180 Markets in our COVID-related world. We're taking advantage, though, and having these great discussions with, you know, various MDs and industries that you may otherwise have been have been amiss. Anyway, with that introduction, everybody's familiar with the big commodities, gold and silver. We can see gold, you know, crossing almost $2,000 an ounce now. But one commodity that we may or may not be as familiar with is graphite. And the uses, let me tell you, go beyond golf clubs and tennis rackets. But to tell us more about it is Tom Revy, Managing Director of Black Earth Minerals. We're gonna discuss his company, the industry, his background, and why maybe this commodity doesn't quite get the respect it deserves. With that introduction, Tom, welcome to 18 Minutes with 180 Markets. Thanks very much. Hey, Tom, everybody's got a story I always like to say. Can you just tell us how you got from when you were 10 years old to where you are today in, in, a, in a fairly quite, uh, quick a matter of time? 10 years old, well, that's, that's <laughs> quite some decades ago, but let's, let's cut to the chase. In, in uh, high school, I was looking for um, something that was perhaps adventurous, um, challenging, um, and uh, potentially lucrative. And uh, I sat down with my old uh, um, in, uh, careers officer at school and he said, why don't you consider mining? And I've got to thank that man because uh, I've loved the industry ever since. So I studied metallurgy um, initially um, and went into operations. It was the start of the gold boom, um, which uh, saw a huge increase in gold production in the 80s, uh, fundamentally because the introduction of CRP technology out of South Africa. And it was great to ride that wave. Um, from, from there, I sort of moved around and I, I lived in various parts of Western Australia on various gold mines. Um, ended up at Dominion Mining, which at the time was one of the biggest gold producers in Australia. And I had the honour of working for a gentleman called Peter Walker, who was managing director. And uh, even though I was in my uh, mid twenties, I learned so much from that man working directly for him. And um, from there, I basically went into a, a number of different paths. The 90s, as you'll remember, was a, uh, an interesting time from a mining industry point of view. And I actually had a crack at, uh, at broking at one stage. I worked for JB Weir. And, and whilst I wouldn't go back to that, um, it, was a, it was a great insight into what investors look for um, and what they don't want to see and how they want to be treated. So that gave me a really good insight into that. I moved into MIM. Um, uh, with um, uh, mergers and acquisitions on a global basis out of Brisbane. Um, again, learnt a lot about the international or the global mining scene at that stage. Uh, went into Minproc uh, just before the mi uh, last mining boom around about 2001 and uh, looked after various areas there globally, including uh, mining geology, engineering process studies, etc., and had a great time there went into Worley and eventually morphed myself into corporate world um, and where I find myself today. And, and I was lucky enough to, uh, to acquire this asset in 2017 and um, the rest is history. That's uh, an incredibly diverse background, but I, I love it in the sense of you have that combination of the geo background, but also the financial uh, I don't know if you call it uh, experience, if you will, to understand uh, the market and what's happening on the ground. That's fantastic. Um, so as I said to you, you know, obviously everybody's pretty familiar with gold and, and silver, but graphite is where you're specializing. Can you just tell people a little bit about the graphite market, if you don't mind? Yeah, they, they, most people would have uh, encountered graphite far earlier than they encountered gold or silver. Um, going to school using the pencil, uh, certainly contains graphite, and graphite's been used for as a writing implement for probably the last five or six hundred years, and hasn't been substituted. Um, that's obviously a fairly specific type of graphite. Um, graphite's used in lubricants. Um, it's used um, in uh, the refractory areas in terms of crucibles and furnace lining, sort of high temperature, high corrosive type environments. And then uh, more recently, people would be okay with the, the use of graphite in battery anodes, even though it's been in a battery anode for a long, long time. Um, 
but also into the fire retardant materials and the um, high value graphite foils. And um, it was only, I think, a year or so ago when CSIRO were working on a, on a graphene filter for filtering water inexpensively. So it's interesting that it's been around for hundreds of years and it's, uh, it has very, very rarely been substituted. The, the list of uses has just gone on and on and on. So it's, it's all around us. Um, it's integral to both past industries, but also for investors' interest in future industries, in future green industries. And so that's what excites us. You know, I, 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 think, it's a, I think it's a great spot to be in. Right. And also, can you just talk a little bit, people do understand supply and demand. Can you just give a, a very high level overview of maybe the supply demand situation and also the geographic regions globally of where the big producers are? Sure. Look, in, in terms of supply, everybody who's had some sort of connection with graphite understands that China is the dominant player. If you look at it from a, a critical commodity point of view, the supply risk is, is one of the key reasons it's on that commodity, uh, uh, com key commodity uh, list. So um, supply out of China, they supply around about 65 to 70% of, of graphite, depending on what you uh, uh, what, what article you read, but it's predominantly fine. And, and where the market often misses the point is the enormous differentiation in terms of graphite um, and graphite products that are needed on the market that come out of mine sites. And that reflects ultimately what's in the ground. So fine, gen as a generalization, the finer material will go into things such as batteries and lubricants. Uh, the the mid-sized material will go into refractory materials, which I mentioned before, and the coarser materials, which are the high-value uh, sort of area of graphite, goes into fire retardants, goes into um, foils, which are used in mobile phones, in laptops as heat sinks, they're used as gaskets, etc., and uh, they command very, very high prices. Well, okay, now, that makes a lot more sense to us now. And so, so China is the majority of supply, but also I guess really into your business, Africa also is a supply region. And maybe that's a good segue into your Madagascarian project and you want to be to discuss that a little bit more. Sure. Look, um, uh, back in 2016, I was I finished up with one company and um, I was looking for something to do and I was approached by a group of investors about looking at graphite. And um, I guess similar to your, uh, your investors, I was in the same boat. I had some very, very high level understanding of graphite. But the more I dug into it, the more interesting it became, not just from a technical point of view, but also from a financial point of view and what the future of graphite um, was moving forward. And so it was logical to look for a graphite project um, in an area that had graphite mining history, that had a reputation for top quality graphite and for being able to do business. Um, I looked at a number of countries um, and I ended up in Madagascar. And Madagascar is, a, uh, is an island. It's probably one of the poorest countries in the world. It's a bit, it'd be in the top five poorest countries. But it's got enormous mineral wealth. And one of those areas is graphite. And it's been mining and exporting graphite for well over 100 years. And in fact, um, back in the 20s, um, the graphite was described as, you know, if you, if you looked at other graphite around the world, there was the Madagascan graphite standard by which everybody measured their own graphite against. So it's, it's got a great reputation and it still exists today. Um, perhaps not with the understanding with investors, but I can certainly say that when I'm talking to end users, as soon as I say, I'm, I'm looking to develop a project in Madagascar, the, uh, there are no fears about Madagascar in terms of being able to do something and being able to supply quality. Right. So, said another way, it's a high quality source of product um, compared to maybe some other regions. And then also, can you just discuss a little bit, you know, I guess, you know, digging into it a little bit more about your project over there, if you don't mind? Sure. Look, it's, um, our, our project is situated in the south of Madagascar. It's about 150 kilometers from um, Rio Tinto's QMM billion dollar project, Mineral Sands project. So we've got some 
some good neighbours. Um, and uh, we have a, an area that has about 34 areas of outcropping graphite uh, from surface. So this is, this is uh, actually relatively easy to um, uh, identify the areas of interest when you first walk across there. Um, we're also about uh, 250 kilometres from the port, and that again is the Rio Tinto port down at uh, Fort Dauphin. And um, Fort Dauphin was built in uh, 2008, 2009. And it's, it, although it was built by Rio Tinto, it's actually open to the public and it's 45% utilised and the port's screaming out for additional customers. So that suits us really yeah. well. There's a road from us to the port. Um, there's ample water supply from underground. Um, power will be initially at least uh, diesel generated. But when we talk about graphite, people shouldn't think about these massive operations. They're low capex projects. Um, you know, we're only going to be pulling something in the order of about two megawatts at any point in time. So we're going to install about four megawatts uh, for standby capability, et cetera. So um, it's, it's, uh, it, our aim is to look towards uh, building a diesel power station to start with. So infrastructure wise, we're fine. Um, there's a sparsity of people in the immediate area, so we don't have any sort of social community issues. In fact, the people who do live in the area have been nothing but extraordinarily helpful. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting attitude, I believe, in Madagascar, is, which is how can we help you develop your project, uh, rather than saying, well, how can we get the most out of it for ourselves? And, and we found them very, very useful at every stage, community, regional, and of course, at the high le highest levels of government. Interesting. And so, and then as far as the, um, the Mannery project timing wise, can you just explain where you stand and I guess, you know, what would be the, you know, maybe a look at the pathway to production at this point? Sure. Um, everybody loves news flow. So that's, yes. that's always a good question. Um, look, um, we, we undertook an advanced scoping study initially. Um, and when I say advanced scoping study, it was probably the best part of about two thirds or three quarters of a pre-feasibility study. So the board last year decided that based on the robust outcomes of the study, that we would just move straight into a definitive feasibility study. So we're, we're in that stage at the moment, DFS or BFS, depending on yep. where you come from. And so it's all about detail. Um, we believe we've done sig uh, enough work and we've done significant work of what's in the ground. Um, I think some of the lessons learnt from others are, particularly in the graphite space, you have to know what's in the ground because it's not like having gold or copper or, or nickel or iron ore in the ground. Um, there's, there's, it's critical towards understanding what's in the ground, which ultimately dictates what products you can produce. Are those products in high demand and at what value are they? And then what we're doing now, now that we've completed all, the, all of that, we're now reverse engineering to ensure that we can produce, based on the ore that exists uh, at Maneri, uh, products which are consistent and of the high standards necessary in order to meet the specifications of the end users. So we're at that point now. In terms of completing the feasibility study, we have an integral uh, part of that is the completion of the pilot work, which we're doing in China. We exported 60 ton of ore recently to a company called Vigram, which is internationally re renowned as a, as a top quality uh, provider of process um, know-how, particularly in the graphite space. So we'll process that 60 ton and come up with a lot of the outcomes as far as the technical outcomes necessary to do the engineering and the costing for the feasibility study, which we hope to finish um, probably late first quarter um, into the second quarter next year. I see. Okay, so about six to nine months away at this point in time. Yes. Okay. And then also, um, you know, within the graphite space, you know, there have been some companies that have gotten into other commodities as well. Um, I'm just curious to see, you know, your thoughts about, uh, how you know strategically would you move into another commodity or what how would you approach your business obviously you have a corporate hat on it you're the md yeah sure look i mean we, we we've observed a few of our peers moving into other commodities and and that's fine and in some cases they've had 
um, pretty good success as far as share price is concerned. I guess that's what it's about at the end of the day. From our perspective, we're keen on um, moving forward in that graphite space. And if, for example, an opportunity came in to uh, add value to the company in that graphite space, then we'd definitely look at it. And, and now is a great time to be looking at those sorts of things um, because um, the market is, is, uh, is providing a lot of opportunity. And, you know, like if a, if a value adding opportunity came along to take our already high value product another step forward, well, that'd be great. And um, we'd certainly be interested in maybe something uh, along those lines. Right, but not moving into gold, silver, or some no, or another commodity. No. You want to say we are the graphite people. <laughs> Absolutely, and then the so the DFS would come out, you know, as you said, six to nine months, and just obviously, uh, again, you know, putting on your corporate hat, we we need to have money to fund everything. How is the balance sheet looking at this point in time? Yeah, well, we're about to put out our quarterly, so I can't actually tell you okay. what our current cash position is. Okay. But um, suffice to say, in our last quarterly, we had over a million dollars. I think it was 1.2 or 1.4 million dollars off the top of my right. head. Um, our burn rate is very low. I'm the only full-time employee in Australia. Everybody else is on contract and used as on a as-required basis. Um, and we have a shared office environment with some other corporates, etc. So we, our overheads are very low the funds that come in go directly into the project. So, um, you know, we, we um, will we require to do a, a fundraise between now and the completion of the feasibility? Anybody right. who's been game long enough knows that the answer is yes. Are we in a hurry to do an equity raise? No, there's no hurry at all. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Well, it seems like it's a really, uh, you know, a, a pure play, uh, pretty, even if it's a couple of years out, a, a pretty clear pathway to, to victory, if you will. You know, you've got the, you've got your project. You're going to get your DFS. You've got infrastructure in place. We understand the, you know, the, the demand side of the equation. Um, in closing, is there anything that you'd like to leave our our listeners with as far as graphite and and, and your your company? Sure. Look, I mean, I, I, I'm a firm believer. I've looked at a lot of commodities, the, the bulk commodities, the precious metals, the, the base metals, etc. cetera. Um, graphite is one of those ones with a tremendous future moving forward, in ter particularly in terms of demand. No matter how you look at it and how pessimistically you look at it, the uh, outlook for graphite in terms of uh, the key areas the cornerstone areas of the refractory area, the, the lubricants, et cetera, is steady. The outlook, however, for battery anodes, the outlook for fire retardant material, the outlook for graphite foils, et cetera, is, is tremendous. And, and the supply, I'm not sure where it's going to come from. Um, and it looks like there'll be a squeeze in the next couple of years in terms of supply demand, I believe, dependent on what's happening with COVID at the moment. Um, but, you know, from our point of view, when you look at a project, it doesn't matter what commodity it is. You need to be in the right jurisdiction. You need to have the right um, technically um, viable project. It needs to have robust financials. You need to have the right people. Social community environment needs to be, um, in, you know, have all the right path moving forward. And I believe we tick every one of those boxes. And as long as you do that, you know, you will make money and you will provide a return to shareholders, which hopefully will reflect in a, an attractive share price for current and future investors. Absolutely, Tom. Well, with that closing, thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to sharing the story with you. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye -bye.